Okay, great. Uh, now that we are recording, um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Karl Lien from uh, Humboldt University in Berlin, speaking about table of degrees. Thanks. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Anders, for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to speak. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here virtually and I hope to see uh, many of you in person at some point in the United States. Um, right, so the, the title of this talk is Tevelev Degrees and I'll explain um, hopefully in the first half where the title, where the name Tevelev Degrees comes from. Um, but this is based on work with, um, well, by various combinations of the people listed here. Um, and th this will come up and some of which uh, I've also contributed to. Okay, so let me start by uh, just introducing the basic question. Um, so to start, uh, X will be a smooth projective variety. I will always work out the complex numbers uh, and I will always call its dimension R, okay? And uh, I will fix general points on X, which I will call X1 through Xn. Okay, so I'm reading here. Um, and I will also fix a curve class on X. So you can think of this as, a, uh, as some effective class living in the second homology. Okay, and in addition to that data, I also want to fix uh, the data of a curve with n points on it. Okay, so the this n here with the number of points on the curve is equal to the number of points on x. Okay, so the question I want to ask is how many ways can I map the curve to the to the target variety? Okay, and I want to uh, impose the conditions that on the one hand the uh, points that I've marked, so the points on the curve are supposed to map to the points on the target variety. And the degree of the map is supposed to be given by uh, the homology, homology class that I've chosen. Okay, so the push, if I push forward the fundamental class of the curve uh, to X, I should get some curve class on X, and that's, the, that's supposed to be the curve class that I fixed at the beginning. Okay, so you can think of beta as like the degree of the map. Okay, so that's the question. And let me just um, give an equivalent formulation. So here I've... Uh, uh, I've, I've made a map tau. So the source of this map is the space MGN X comma beta. Um, so this is the moduli space of just maps from any curve C to X. Um, and again, I require that the, uh, this map have degree given by beta. So beta is part of the data. So the push forward of the fundamental class is supposed to be equal to beta. And um, this N denotes the number of mark points on my, on my uh, source curve, okay? And uh, to that, uh, that has a map. So on the one hand, I can forget the data of the map and just remember the source curves. So that has a map to uh, the usual MGN. So it just remembers the, the source curve of the map with its mark points. Uh, and the other hand, I can also just map, I can remember uh, just the data on the target. So namely, I could remember the positions of the, the images of the mark points, the end mark points. So I have one map to MGN, I have another map to X to the N, so I can make a map to the product. Um, and so the question of S is equivalently, uh, what is the degree of this map, right? Because we're saying, well, fix a point of the target, which is the data of n points on x, along with uh, a fixed curve and n points on the curve. And we're asking how many maps are there uh, that live over that data, OK? And I call this map tau. And uh, if the degree of this map is well-defined, uh, I denote it by tev. Uh, sub g beta n. So g is the genus of the curve, beta is the degree, it's the curve class, and n is the number of mark points. And of course, this, the superscript x is the target variety. Okay, and this is what I'll refer to in this talk as the uh, geometric Tevelev degree for x. Okay, so there are questions about this, uh, this setup as I've, as I've formulated it. Okay. So, um, okay, so of course this question is only reasonable if uh, this degree is expected to be finite. So I should do a dimension count to um, put myself in a situation where this is true. Um, so if you've seen the computation of the expected dimension of MG and X beta, um, it's given by some formula. And if you haven't seen this computation, it's not so important, uh, but there's some formula for the, uh, ex at least the expected dimension of this moduli space of maps. Um, and that's this line here. So the expected dimension of the space mg and x beta is it's given by this formula with the purple dot. And then the, the, uh, the dimension of the target, which is uh, which, which we know in all cases, it's, well, 3g minus g plus n, which is the dimension of mgn, and then um, plus rn, which is the dimension of x to the m. OK, and if I want this map tau to be finite, then, well, I should, I should at least demand that the expected dimension of the, the source space is equal to the target space. 
Okay. And uh, all right, so then you can rearrange this equation. And this gives you some uh, numerical condition on what the number of mark points should be. Okay, so n should be equal to one minus g plus, um, there's an x missing here, plus one over r times the integral of beta times the first term class of the tangent bundle. Okay, so um, remember that beta is a uh, is a curve class. It's a class living in the second homology of x, and the first term classes of the uh, the first term class of the tangent bundle is a class living in um, the second cohomology of x. Right, because it's a first term class. Um, so you can pair these two things and integrate them. So you get a number, uh, and that number is this integral. Okay, so we'll see an example of, of, of this uh, in a little bit. Okay, so for this question to really make sense, uh, I, I, I need to assume that this numerical condition, otherwise I sort of can't really hope for, uh, for tau to be um, a finite map. And uh, so throughout this talk, I will assume this numerical condition. Right, so in particular, n is always determined by um, the other characters in this story. So it's determined by the genus, um, the target variety x, and the curve class that I've chosen. Okay, and well, um, so I've been using the term expected dimension for the space mg and x beta. So there's some notion of the expected dimension. There's some naive dimension cut that you would, uh, um, that you hope that the space has. Um, but it can happen that, um, well, this this space this has this space has dimension higher than expected. Um, so this is a story I'm not really going to get into, um, but I do want to note that well, the space mg and x beta, um, because I'm asking for the degree of tau, I only care about the 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 components of this moduli space that that actually dominate the target. Right. So uh, mg and x beta can be a uh, very complicated space with many irreducible components. Um, some of them might have this correct dimension, but some of the, and some of them don't. But if I'm only interested in the degree of tau, right? If I'm only interested in the degree of a map coming out of this space, then I only care the components that actually dominate, right? Because so have components that do not surject onto the target, then they're not going to contribute to kind of the number of points in a fiber. Okay. But on the other hand, if there are dominating components that have uh, too high a dimension, right? So if this space, uh, if this if this map tau, in fact, is a is some kind of fibration where the, the fiber is positive dimensional, then I really cannot ask about the degree, in which case this type of degree is not, is not defined. Okay, so in order to make this dimension, I'm this, this definition, I'm assuming two things. I'm assuming one, that I have this numerical condition here, right, in this box. Um, and this numerical condition comes from some calculation of the expected dimension of this space. And so the second thing I'm assuming is that this space actually has the expected dimension at least when you respect to components that uh, that dominate the target. Okay, so I'll give a more concrete example in a bit, but are there, are there questions about what I've said here? Okay, um, so let's do a concrete example. In some sense, this is uh, the main example of this talk. Um, so probably the simplest example you can ask for is this, the, the example of projective space. Okay, so for projective space, um, I need to fix a curve class, and well, um, the second cohomology of projective space uh, is has rank one. Um, so the only the only invariant of a second homology of a, of a curve class in projective space is, is its degree. Okay, so the data of beta is simply the data of a degree um, of a curve living in projective space. And well, and the space MGN PRD is simply the space you can think of as some kind of Hilbert scheme of, um, of curves of degree D inside projective space. And um, OK, and if you haven't seen this, the, these stable map spaces before, well, you can, you can still think about this, the dimension of the space of maps to PR of degree D. Um, so one way you can think of this is in terms of the Riemann rock formula. So if you fix a curve, for instance, uh, then you can ask, well, what's a, what's a map of degree D to PR? Well, it's like a line bundle of degree D plus R plus one sections. And uh, Riemann rock at least gives you, gives you some naive comp uh, for how many of those you would expect there to be, right? At least if, this, if the line bundle you chose is non-special. Okay, so if you haven't seen this before, this is actually a good exercise to work out. So you can pretend if you want that D is very large. Um, and if you fix a curve, there's some, there's some space of maps to a projective space and you can count the dimensions of that space. Um, and then you can count the dimensions of the space of curves. Um, and then, then you'll end up with this formula. 
Okay, but in any case, the expected dimension of the space is, is given by this number, 3g minus 3 plus n um, plus d times r plus 1 minus r times g minus 1. And well, I said, well, and, and, and again, in order for this, uh, in order for this, this, this tau to be kind of reasonable, I need, um, I need my, fi my, my fibers to be finite. So I should uh, require that this number, this dimension is equal to the, the dimension of the target. And moreover, uh, the classical results from Bill Nerda theory tells us that in fact, um, the moduli space of maps to projective space actually does have the correct dimension, at least if you restrict to components that dominate uh, MGN, right? So another way to say this is that if you take a general curve, um, the space of maps to a projective space, a general fixed curve, is the space of maps to a projective space of some degree has the expected dimension. So what this tells you is that when you compare this formula, um, to the, uh, as we did here, to the dimension of the target. So in this case, you'd get just MGN cross uh, PR to the N. And uh, you kind of take this numerical condition, which I've written down for a general X. Um, then whenever N is sort of the, the expected number of points where you would hope, where you'd hope that tau is finite, just based on the naive dimension counts. Um, in fact, uh, there is a, there is a well-defined degree. So this map tau is in fact, generically finite, uh, and its degree is some well-defined number that you can ask for. Okay, so in the end, if we ask this question for projective space, we always, at least if the degree is positive, we always get, uh, can hope for a reasonable answer. Right? So if you, you can, if you fix a curve and you fix a projective space and you fix a bunch of points, you can ask for the number of maps from the curve to the projective space of some degree, um, and the naive dimension counts uh, Kind of imply that there's a finite number of such maps. Okay. All right. So there are questions about this example. Okay. Great. So uh, this is sort of the classical way to formulate the the question. Again. So I, I'm just asking a very um, I'm asking you sort of what I would consider to be a very basic question. If you fix a curve and you fix a target variety, how many maps can you make between them? And of course, you can formulate that, that basic question in terms of these moduli spaces. Um, now, if one allows uh, themselves to work in the language of Grom of Witten theory, there's actually a very natural alternative formulation of this question. So before on the previous slide, I had the spaces mg and x beta and mgn without bars. Um, but in Groom of Witten theory, uh, there's a very natural compactification of the space mg and x beta bar. And this is the, the moduli space of stable maps. Okay, and the advantage of this somehow is that now I have a proper moduli space, right? So in, in general, mg and x beta is, is typically not proper, but there, there is some compactification called the moduli space of stable maps. Um, and one feature of this moduli space of stable maps is that if I forget the source curve, I don't just get a curve of MGN, but I rather get a curve of MGN bar. Okay, so I get some kind of stable curve. And um, all right, so I'm not going to get into the definition of stable maps. It doesn't really matter for this talk, but it's just some compactification of the space of maps in the usual sense, um, where the target is some kind of singular nodal curve instead of just a smooth curve. Okay, so in particular, if you if you work with this moduli space of stable maps, you can kind of compactify the morphism tau, which I defined earlier, um, and you get this picture. So I have a I have a map from the space of stable maps to this to the space of stable curves cross uh, points on X. Okay, so if you just do this, um, okay, so so far so good, and if you you could you could do the same dimension counts as before, and you could kind of think about uh, when you want this map to be generically finite, and that's for its degree. But in fact, you're not. Uh, at least if you kind of, at least if you take the closure of the, um, the 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 space of maps with smooth target, you're not going to get any different answer here, right? Because somehow you're just you're asking for a degree. So if you if you just compactify everything, you're not going to. The answer will not change. But on the other hand, what this moduli space of stable maps also gives you is uh, gives you access to is a virtual fundamental class. So as I have alluded to before, the, uh, the space of maps to X, even without the bar, uh, can have the wrong dimension, in which case the dimension case counts that I wrote down will be incorrect. And uh, the Tevlev degrees that I've defined will be undefined. 
But when you pass to the space of the moduli space of stable maps, this still might will have the wrong dimension. Compactifying can, in fact, make things worse. But what you do have is a virtual fundamental class, which lives in the expected dimension uh, of this moduli space um, and is somehow a completely canonical object. And this virtual fundamental class, this is a long story, which I also will not get on to um, get into, but this is supposed to be some kind of um, correction or some kind of replacement of the usual fundamental class when the, the actual dimension of the space is not agreed with the, the expected dimension. But because this virtual class lives in the expected dimension, well, the expected dimension is something I always have control over. Right, so the, the actual dimension might be something I have, uh, I have no control over, right? I might not know what that is. It might just be too large, but the expected dimension uh, is simply given by the formula um, that we had on this second slide. Which means that, well, if you assume that uh, the, the virtual dimension or the expected dimension of MG and X beta is equal to the dimension of the target, then if I push forward this virtual class, which lives in the expected dimension, I always get something downstairs that's just, uh, that lives in the, the, um, the top homology, right? Because I've, I've put myself in the situation where the virtual dimension agrees with, uh, of the top agrees with the actual dimension of the bottom. So no matter what the, what the actual dimension of the space of stable maps is, I can push forward this virtual class. I know I'm going to get a multiple of the fundamental class. And that multiple is, 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 you can think of as some kind of virtual degree, right? So if MGN X beta bar is kind of smooth of the expected dimension, at least on dominating components, this will agree with the actual degree. Um, but the upshot of this definition from Witten theory is that, well, uh, I don't need to care, uh, at least in principle, about what the actual dimension of the space is because this virtual fundamental class will be defined um, nonetheless. So we define the virtual fund the virtual Tefelev degree to be to be uh, well the rational number such that when I push forward the virtual class um, I get that multiple of the fundamental class downstairs. Okay, and the upshot again, as I've said, is that um, no matter what the actual geometry of this modulized stable maps is, uh, this number will be well defined. Okay. And okay, so this is a, sort of a diversion. This will not sort of play a role in the actual Schubert calculus that will come up in this talk, at least, um, right. So, so it will not play a role in the Schubert calculus results I want to mention. Um, but I do want to mention this because this is sort of a parallel story to the, um, the one I do want to talk about. And in fact, in some sense, it's uh, at least one sense, it's actually an easier story than the, the, the one I want to discuss um, due to the results on the next page. Okay. So I haven't told you anything about, so somehow these geometric Tevelev degrees are kind of the geometric question that I think is, is, much, is, is most natural. You can reformulate the problem in some kind of fancy way with these virtual classes, whatever that means in Groom of Witten theory. And uh, the funny thing that happens is that uh, actually the Groom of Witten numbers are much easier to compute. And I haven't told you anything about how to compute the geometric numbers that will come later. But I do want to mention this result of uh, Anders and Rahul Pandurapande, which uh, to my knowledge is, is, is soon forthcoming, um, which is that there's just some formula for the virtual temple of degree that uh, is just completely universal. Okay, so I'm not going to explain really what this formula means. So uh, it's, uh, it's given in terms of some classes that are uh, defined in the quantum cohomology of X, which is some kind of deformation um, in Grimm of Witten theory of the usual cohomology of X. Um, but I do want to write this formula just to, just to show you that there is one. Right, so the point here is that if you have a complete understanding of the quantum cohomology of X, which we do in many examples, um, then computing these virtual type of degrees becomes complete, uh, is, is, is really a completely combinatorial problem. Right, so the proof goes through some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of, standard yoga and Grimm of Witten theory that I won't get into. But the upshot then is that if you understand this, if you kind of um, do the, do or black box the kind of hard work of defining and, and, and understanding the quantum cohomology of X, then what you get out of this package is some, is some very concrete combinatorial problem um, uh, when one asks for these virtual degrees. Okay, so as an example, um, 
So as examples of this uh, applications of this formula, uh, so if you ask the virtual tableau question for projective space, um, so this is again the virtual number. So this is the this is sort of the virtual number of maps from C, which is genus G, to PR with some number of incident incidence conditions. You get the very simple answer R plus one to the G. Okay, and this R plus one is in fact the Euler characteristic of PR. Okay, and this is actually a pretty easy calculation because the quantum cohomology of projective space is, is something easy. Okay, and a somewhat uh, a considerably harder computation is uh, that for hypersurfaces in PR plus one. So they also show um, that if you take a hypersurface of a degree not too large, so I think degree about uh, um, no more than half the dimension of the projectus or of, of, the, of the dimension, um, then again, there's just some formula for this virtual tevelet tev degree. So this is the virtual number of maps of some curve of genus G to a hypersurface of low degree. Okay, and then for some technical reasons, I have to say that the degree is at least three here, but there's some other formula for hypersurfaces of degree two. Okay, so another example that comes up in their paper is that of flag varieties, and those are also uh, spaces X for which we know something about the quantum cohomology. Um, but there, I think the formulas are not so, not as easy, if I, uh, I'm not mistaken. Okay, so I think this paper will be out soon if, uh, I'm, my information is not correct, uh, not incorrect. So uh, uh, you can read more about this there. Okay, but I want to mention this result. Okay, so in the end, this this is this virtual table of question in some sense is, well, in a kind of theoretical sense, is completely answered by this this very nice formula. Um, but then there's a, there there's a kind of very rich combinatorial uh, question, which is well, for particular examples of X, can you actually compute this? And um, this paper of Anders and Rahul is, is sort of the first um, kind of serious attempt to do this. Okay. Okay, so where do I want to go in this talk? So I'd like to go back to the, the, the geometric Tevelev degrees, which I've um, claimed are on the one hand kind of more geometrically natural, but on the other hand, um, they're at least at the moment, we don't have a, a formula that's nearly this nice or any formula. So at least for the perhaps simplest example of projective spaces, can we compute these ge geometric numbers? So we have some kind of mysterious virtual count of these, of these maps, um, but can we, get, can we get the actual count? Right, so that's direction one, and that's the direction I wanna spend the most time on. And direction two is, well, we have these very nice virtual formulas, at least in some cases. And so, well, when does the virtual, when does the virtual uh, tableau degree, so when does the virtual count agree with the actual count? Right, so when is this kind of mysterious um, machine of, of, of virtual fundamental classes actually producing the, the number um, that has kind of the most obvious geometric meaning? Okay, in other words, when are the virtual counts enumerative? Okay, I should say in, in the kind of usual Grom of Witten theory setup, the answer is usually, is, is often kind of never, um, but in fact, uh, one nice feature about these Tevlev degrees is that they're somehow so constrained that, uh, in fact, the virtual Tevlev degrees do tend to, do seem to be equal to the actual Tevlev degrees, the geometric Tevlev degrees, um, at least in, in some quantifiable sense, more often than the Grom of Witten, the, the usual Grom of Witten variants. Okay, so what I'd like to do, I think, is state a result for the geometric Tevlev degrees of P1. Um, and then kind of defer the proof to after the break. So I'll state the result and then maybe we'll take the five minute break there. Okay, so as a reminder, so what, so what is the geometric Tevlev problem for P1? In some sense, this is the most concrete question I will put forth in this talk. So again, the, um, the players are a general pointed curve of genus G, so a genus G curves with uh, N points on it. And now I'm gonna take my target to be P1. Um, so this is just the data. So my P1 is X and I'm just gonna take endpoints on that. Okay, and the question is how many uh, maps now do I have um, that have degree D? So this, this, this homology class beta is just gonna be D times the fundamental class. So how many covers of P1 are there of degree D that send while well, the points that started with upstairs to the points that started with downstairs? Okay, and then the numerical condition I need here is that uh, 
uh, n is equal to 2d minus g plus 1. OK. Uh, OK, so are there other questions about just the, the formulation of the geometric problem for P1? OK, great. So let me state, uh, state the theorem. So let me start with uh, the first part. So, uh, so the, the first complete uh, computation of this, of, of this degree was given by um, Alessio Cella, Rahul Pandurapande, and Johannes Schmidt uh, this year. So I think this was March. Um, and well, they gave this formula. So, um, okay, so, so this is for now just a formula, but I wanna just point out a few features. So first is that, so basically what I want, want you to get, for, get it from this is that this formula is saying two G and then minus a bunch of correction terms. So this two to the G um, we saw has, so our, has already come up in one place in this talk. So this two to the G is the virtual tenth left degree, right? Because the virtual tenth left degrees of, of PR we saw are R plus one to the G where G is the genus of the source curve. And so here, this is P1, so the R is one. And so I get two to the G is the virtual degree. And so, and what are all these binomial coefficients? Well, if you, uh, so here I'm denoting the number D minus G minus one as L. And then in these binomial coefficients, uh, notice that the number on the bottom is always some kind of, uh, well, here it's negative L and here it's negative L minus one. And then uh, in the first term, it's ranging from I equals zero to minus L minus two. Okay, so in particular, these binomial coefficients only make sense if L is negative. Right, so what this is saying is that, so when L is positive, actually all these binomial coefficients are, are just interpreted to, to vanish because you're taking G choose some negative number. Okay, so what is this really saying? This is saying that when L, which is, so when, when L is positive, which is to say that D is bigger than G plus one, then all these corrections vanish and the, vert, and the Tevlev degree of, P to the, of, of P1 for genus G and degree D is just two to the G. Okay, and then when L is negative, there's some correction terms. So in other words, when D is large, when I'm counting curves of, uh, when I'm counting covers of large degree, then the geometric table of degree is equal to the virtual table of degree, which, is, which has already been computed to be two to the G. Or rather, I mean, yeah. And well, when the degree is small, then this is not quite correct. And there's some correction terms given by these binomial coefficients. Okay. And um, so then inspired by this result, uh, a couple of months later, so this is March, this, I think this is may, maybe May or June, um, Gabi Farkas and I gave a different proof of this result that goes through Schubert calculus and, and we gave this kind of, and we gave this Schubert calculus formula. Okay, so I wanted to at least say this in the first half of the talk because this is uh, the Schubert seminar. So the theorem is that uh, using different methods, we, should, we compute this degree, we compute this count um, in terms of an intersection number on the Grassmannian. Okay, so this is the Grassmannian of two planes in a D plus one dimensional vector space. Um, as usual, the Schubert class sigma i is the, the i segregate class of the universal bundle. Um, and the claim is that this, uh, this intersection number um, is also e equal to the tablet degree. Okay, so in particular, it's also equal to the number, uh, the formula above, which is not completely obvious. Okay, and I should say all of this was somehow inspired. Um, so the paper of Chela Pandurapande Schmidt was inspired uh, by an early result. So this is December of 2020, uh, and this explains the name. So Tevelev, uh, among many other things, uh, computed. He didn't call them Tevelev degrees, but he computed the number of uh, maps of degree G plus one um, out of a genus G curve with um, with sort of the correct number of uh, mark points to get a final answer, and he found the answer simply two to the G. So in this case, D minus G minus one is, uh, is zero, right? Because D is G plus one. And so all these correction terms vanish. Okay, and his proof is also very different. It, it goes through some kind of degeneration um, that goes through real algebraic geometry. Okay, and um, so I'm not gonna say much about the proof of Chela Pandurapande Schmidt, but I will say it, uh, so, this is really a question about um, you know, counting branch covers of P1, and those are parameterized by a nice moduli space, namely the, the Hurwitz space of branch covers. 
And um, we've made some advances in the in the intersection theory on such moduli spaces in recent years. And um, the proof of Alessio Rahul and Johannes uses some of this machinery. Okay, so what I want to talk about in the second half uh, after the break is is, is the the proof of Gabi and myself. So um, right, so maybe I will stop there for the break, and I don't know if you do questions right now or well, I suppose if there are questions, I, I should answer any. Yeah, thanks very much.